How's my hair look? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Board of County Commissioners Board Meeting of Palm Beach County on December 19th, 2023. If I could have Madame Clerk please call to order. Commissioner Barnett. Call. Here. Commissioner Baxter. Here. Commissioner Bernard. Here. Vice Mayor Marino. Here. Mayor Sachs. Here. Commissioner Weiss. Here. Commissioner Woodward. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody is present and we have a quorum. So I'd like to go ahead and start uh, with um, Commissioner uh, to do the uh, invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Dear God, as we gather here today, we pray that we are ever mindful of opportunities to render our service to fellow citizens and to our community, keeping in mind always the enduring values of life, exerting our efforts in those areas and on those things upon which future generations can build with confidence. Let us continue to strive to make a better world. Amen. Amen. Uh, are there any additions, deletions, substitutions to uh, the agenda at this time? Good morning, Mayor, Vice Good Mayor, morning. and members of the board. Uh, on page 10, there's a revised motion title and summary uh, that reflects none from the clerk's office. On page 53, CC2 is an add-on uh, from the sheriff's office, and page 64 is an add-on from the TDC. Uh, we are waiting on uh, the insurance certificate uh, and that certificate names us as an additional insured. Normally I would not bring this to you, but the timing is critical. And so if you approve this today, it will be contingent upon us receiving that certificate. Very good. Thank you so much, uh, Madam Administrator. Uh, now we're gonna go on to um, looking at our consent agenda. May Which starts page nine is yes. Mayor, um, may I may I make a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? Very good. We have motion by uh, Commissioner Weiss, second by the Vice Mayor. All those approve. Anybody disapprove? See that it passes unanimously. Thank you, Commissioner Weiss. And we're going to move on to the consent agenda, which is found pages nine to fifty-two. Does anybody want to pull any item from the consent agenda at this time? See none? Very good, we're gonna have, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Yes, by Commissioner Barnett, a second uh, by Commissioner Woodward. All those approve, anybody disapprove? See that it passes uh, unanimously. Commissioner Weiss. Thank you, um, didn't wanna hold up the consent agenda, but I did wanna make a comment on item 3X4, uh, found on page 47, and uh, we approved a, uh, uh, an item uh, that is going to allow for an additional um, facility to help uh, with the spay and neuter of dogs and cats in Palm Beach County, and I just wanted to thank staff for bringing that forward, and for Darbster for providing the service. Thank you. I believe that this is going to be in abeyance uh, for 30 to 60 days. Is that correct? Madam that is correct. Very good. And we're Sorry working sure. with um, community veterinarians to see how many we can get for uh, volunteer work, and then we'll fill in with this particular contract. Excellent. Thank you so much, Administrator. Uh, moving on now uh, to public hearings on uh, page 53. If everybody is ready, we're gonna proceed on here um, on public hearing, and this is for the record 4A1. Um, staff recommends a uh, motion to adopt. To, is there a motion to receive 
in file. So moved, Madam Mayor. Very good, thank you. Uh, first by uh, Commissioner uh, Bernard and second by um, Commissioner Baxter. All those for, anybody opposed? See that it passes uh, unanimously. Moving on. Okay, we're ready to proceed on to the regular agenda. Uh, and uh, if there, and that would be from page 54. No, those no, no, we need, to, we need to actually hear the case. We need to on the fire rescue? Yeah, so 4A1. Okay, so going on to 4A1, I believe this is on the fire rescue. I'll make a motion to approve 4A1. Very good. Uh, does, uh, gentlemen, before you have a seat, does, would anybody like to hear a staff report on 4A1? No? Very good, you don't need to sit down yet, you already won. So, uh, but let's just make sure, don't go out of the room yet. Those, um, we have a um, motion by uh, Commissioner Weiss and there's a second by, uh, by Vice Mayor Marino. Uh, all those for, anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously. Now you can leave, gentlemen, thank you. Always good to have the fire department in the house, too. All right, uh, now we're gonna move on to regular agenda. Hi, Ms. Peavy, good to see you. And that uh, begins on page 54 uh, with 5A1. Would anybody like to have uh, a report from staff at this time? From the commission, see none, don't leave yet. You're gonna take off here, aren't you? All right, um, if I could have a motion to approve. So moved. Done by Commissioner Weiss and a second by uh, Commissioner Baxter. All those for, anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously. Thanks for your excellent report. Um, moving on to 5B1, Housing and Economic Development. Uh, would anybody like to have a report from staff at this time? See none. Folks, good to see you. You don't need to sit down yet. Let's just see. Is there um, a motion to adopt by Commissioner Baxter, the first? I, I see a second by Commissioner Weiss. All those for, anybody opposed? See that it passes 5B1. Thank you again for that excellent re report. Okay, for the record, Neither the taxing power nor the faith and credit of the county nor any county funds are pledged to pay the principal redemption premium, if any, or interest on the bonds. That's even better. Thank you so much. Moving on now, 5B2, uh, and this is housing and economic development continued. Uh, do we need to hear uh, staff reports? Nope. See no reason, I have a first. Mayor, I'll make a motion to adopt and also note for the record, neither the taxing power nor the faith and credit of the county nor any county funds shall be pledged to pay principal or redemption premiums, if any, or interest on the bonds. Thank you very much. So we have a first by the vice mayor and a second by um, Commissioner Weiss. All those for, anybody against? See that it passes, 5B2 passes unanimously. Moving on to 5B3. A, B, and C. Uh, before we ask for, is there anybody who would like to have a report on this? See none, thanks for staying, folks. Uh, do I have a first? I have from Commissioner Baxter, and I see a second from Commissioner Barnett. Uh, all those for it, anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously uh, for 5B, 3A, B, and C. Now we're going on to the water. Let's go on to water, 5C, 1, A, B, and C, and that is, uh, do we wish to have a report from our water utilities folks? Good morning, Mr. Bayat. I think so. Yes, we do. Okay, we'd like to hear about water. Mr. Bayat. Madam Mayor, uh, go right Mayor, ahead. Commissioners, Administrator Baker, and County Attorney. Uh, first, before we begin, if it's okay with you, I'd like to indulge. We have a number of staff from water utilities that's with us who play a key integral role in this project. Obviously, it's a very big one that spanned quite a bit of time in the planning. And if I could just ask them to stand, please, and be recognized, and I want to thank good. them personally for their work. Oh. Very well, thank you. 
<laughs> thank and, you very much, Mr. Von Laren. Thank, thank you, you so much. I appreciate your indulgence in that. Um, so there's a couple of things we want to do. First, uh, uh, Jen Cirillo is with us, Director of Parks and Recreation, in addition to Ali Bayat and Mike Jones from the County Attorney's Office. Um, this is one of those projects, and we have this great relationship with water utilities and parks and recreation, particularly out at Green K, where we've you know, funded our water utility project and then having a partner with Parks and Recreation to, to run and operate some of that has been a, a real blessing. Uh, before we begin, I wanted to, we have a brief video that we would like to show you. It's about two minutes, and I think it captures some of the essence of Green K and what we're trying to do out there with this facility, particularly the education facility. So if we can roll that very, very quickly. Water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. It comes from the natural earth, um, water towers. Walmart. 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 We shower with water, we take a bath in water, we water the plant. You need it to survive. Animals need clean water. I'd say water is the most important because it holds up all the other living things. For most living things on Earth, any living organism to survive, they need water, they depend on water, so it's very important to everyday life. <laughs> Seventy five percent of the planet is water. action would be to um, first to educate the public starting with kids because I think if people would realize how much that we depend on water and everything depends on water to live it would kind of put more importance around preserving water. So thank you. A really magnificent facility planned and a lot of uh, hard work has gone into this. We have a very brief PowerPoint that I will quickly go through um, just to kind of share with you sort of the humble beginnings of this and where we are today. So as many of you know, our water utility is the third largest in the state of Florida. Uh, drinking water, wastewater, and reclaimed water are the three main areas that we work with. We service 600,000 plus uh, customers and have over 600 employees. Um, zero violations at our water utility. Uh, our, our rates are one of the best in the state of Florida, 29% uh, below the state of Florida average and, and many accolades, including our AAA bond rating. Um, just some of our water supply challenges, as you see, population growth, competing demands, drought, saltwater intrusion, nutrients and the like are all issues that uh, are, are pushing us more and more on the issue of reuse. This just gives you a nice overview of how our alternative uh, water supply and where we use it from uh, creating our wetlands like Wakotahatchee and Green, Green K to irrigation of our golf courses and then using our Florida aquifer and also our Biscayne aquifer that you see in that graph 
uh, for our potable consumption. And then to encourage conservation, we have tiered pricing that we use in order to do that, as well as some outreach and education. Um, the humble beginnings of Green K, the Winsburg family, uh, who sold us that property. Uh, it was a green pepper farm, and this is what it is today. Um, what we do there is at our southern region reclamation facility, uh, we clean that water. It goes into Green K phase one, Green K phase two, and that water creates the life that we see out there. It's pretty amazing. Those birds weren't there before uh, we did this, and uh, they love it now. Um, this just goes to show you, you know, how many people come and visit our facility, uh, the boardwalks we have, one of the top-rated TripAdvisor destinations, and 550 million gallons a year flow through uh, those wetlands today. Um, this gives you an overview of the site. So on the very uh, west side of that, on, on number one, that's where our southern reclamation facility is. Just below it, number two, is where the new reclamation facility and education facility are going to be that feed into number four, which is the new uh, Green K uh, Park and also our, our, our water production wells. Um, this shows you the advanced water purification that we're going to be using with our ultrafiltration, reverse osmosis, and our UV um, advanced um, oxidation, and that will yield a very high quality purified water that will be of drinking water quality standard. Um, that you saw in the video what our facility will look like on the inside. What you saw here is what it looks like on the outside. Um, in addition to some of the exhibits inside that we gave you a little insight in the video, our park that we took you on a virtual tour through uh, with a playground area, pavilions, um, even allowing for some kayak launching there for individuals who bring it, and then a series of walking trails, and that's an example of what those walking trails uh, will look like um, in another one of our existing parks today with connectivity to phase one of Green K. Uh, the core messaging from our uh, different uh, core messaging projects, water supply and aquifer recharge, uh, leader in reuse innovation. This is one of the first in the country that we're doing of this, environmental stewardship, and then education and outreach, and that's why we focus so much on the kids in that particular video. Um, our scope and cost, I want to thank this board because you've previously approved $9.6 million, and we've done the scoping of the project, the pilot, which has successfully been completed, uh, the permitting, pre-construction, public outreach, the bidding, which is what we brought back to you today, and the guaranteed maximum price uh, for the phase uh, two completion. That just shows our pilot study. Uh, this is all the science that goes into creating that great purified uh, water and then the public outreach initiatives that we have. And I know many of you have been out there and visited, and we've captured, captured some of you in these photographs and many different civic organizations that we've been, as well as our neighbors around it. And they've given us a lot of great ideas to date that we've incorporated into the plan around the park and of the facility. And the public outreach continues. Uh, again, here you'll see. Uh, with our school district, who I know that some of our school uh, district teachers and others are here with us today in support of this. And then this is the meat of what's before you today. Uh, the balance of the cost of $89.6 million, our guaranteed maximum price. Uh, CDM is our contractor, and this was a design build. So they're from the beginning design till the end uh, when it comes to the startup commissioning um, and training. We're very proud of the grants that we've received to date, $18.5 million, with more in the process of coming in on this particular program. Um, and the state and the water management district have been uh, key partners in this and support uh, this particular project and are very excited about um, its future. And then you see our schedule here. Uh, we'll complete our, our plan and design December of 23, groundbreaking in 2024, February, and then an August 2026 completion date. Um, and, uh, and, and our team's gonna be working very hard uh, to make this happen. So Mayor, uh, that, those are our comments that we wanted to share with you today, and we appreciate it and would appreciate uh, your continued support of this important project for Palm Beach County. Thank you so much, Mr. Von Laren. Uh, I'd like to recognize Commissioner Woodward. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you for this presentation. I did get the chance to go visit several months ago. This is a really mm -hmm. good project. Um, I say all water is recycled water. It's not something everybody wants to think about, but it is. And this is, is a good thing that you're doing. And being able to recharge our aquifers, minerals will be going into this area, sinking through, sinking through the ground, feeding life. And this, this is amazing. And it's, I'm so proud to know that we're, I think, the first in the state to do this. And one of the first ones nationally. So hopefully this is 
a good example for other areas to be able to do the same thing. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Woodward. Um, any other comments by the members of the commission? I'd like to thank you, Todd uh, Bonlaren, for your leadership and advocacy for Green K. Um, I'm so proud of this, uh, this park, which is really a water filtration. And uh, it's amazing how all the animals came to it uh, and are there today. And if anyone listening to this uh, broadcast, if you've ever been to any park, any place in this county, this is a place to go. It is just, it's like, it's like a primordial Florida. Beautiful, and of course, we're, you know, we're cleaning our water, which is a beautiful dual purpose of this. Um, and I'd like to thank you, Mr. Bayat, for everything you do to make our Palm Beach County waters number one in the state. And I always tell everybody, my kids always want to have another filter for the water, so you don't need it. You can take it right from the tap, and it is just as clean. And all the staff that you have here today, thank you, because the work that you do makes our living so much easier, cleaner, healthier, because if we don't have clean water, we don't have a county. We don't have good people here, so healthy people. Thank you so much to all the staff there at the water filtration. And I welcome any commissioner to go there uh, to see it. Been there. Uh, it yeah, because it is, it is really, really fabulous. Um, commissioner Weiss. Thank you, Mayor. I, I just have uh, one question, and then we have a public comment. Um, my question uh, it would be in regards to PFAS, as we know that there is going to be, uh, this is being regulated, and, and so can you talk a little bit about uh, what your understanding of this facility will be able to do in relation to PFAS? Sure. Uh, Palm Beach County Water Utilities. Uh, the process that we're using is the most recommended process nationwide right now to remove all kind of PFAS. And we did pilot it for that purpose, and the results was absolutely in line with what we were thinking. So it will remove all the PFAS. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, all right, let's, um, if I could have a motion at this time with regard to 5C1. I'll make a motion to. Um, did you have a Do we have a comment? card? I believe we have a card. It, it's a, um, this is, uh, was submitted online, so Very I'll go good. ahead and That's read it. good enough for me. This is from uh, Diana Snyder, and her message is that the uh, District Strategic Plan Initiative A3A calls for defining the essential characteristics of the future Palm Beach County schools graduate in collaboration with our community and align learning opportunities for all students. One of those essential characteristics in includes connecting district students with community partners through experiences such as Green K Phase Two Progressive Design Build. This project holds the potential to partner with the district to educate our students uh, about the importance of responsible water use and reuse, ensuring the future of our community. The school district looks forward to Palm Beach County Water Utilities Green K expansion and commits to future discussions in hopes of cycling our grade two students through the planned interactive experience. Very good. Thank you very much. There are no other cards on this? So, Mayor, uh, at this time, I'll make a motion for 5C, 1A, B, and C. Can we, Madam Attorney, can we go ahead and do all A, B, and C at the same time? Very good. I have uh, the first by, uh, by Vice Mayor and the second by Commissioner Baxter. All those four. Anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think I'd like to move right on now to 5C1. 5D1. And uh, we can excuse staff unless there's any questions for them. So, 5D1. 5C1. We just passed it. Okay, very good. Oh, wow. I've got a whole long summary on that. Yeah, Mayor, right. I will make a motion to approve the agreement for purchase, a memorandum of agreement um, for properties in Palmar. This would be 5D, 1A, B, C, and D. Very good. Um, and we have a second. We have first by Vice Mayor, second by Commissioner Weiss. All those four. Anybody oppose? Very good. See that it passes unanimously. Thank you, folks, for coming by. All right, now we're looking at 5D1. Um, and uh, just so that we note, 
Okay, very good. There are no funds on that. Going on to 5E1, there is a um, resolution uh, at this time, 5E1. And uh, if there are no questions or comments. Mayor. Or, um, yes, Commissioner Baxter, go right ahead. Thank you. I would like to make the motion to adopt this with one change I would like to make. The very last, I guess it would be the second to last line where basically is limiting. Never mind. I just want to make the motion to approve. Thank you. Well, that was easy. Very good. Thank you, Commissioners. First by Commissioner Baxter, a second by Commissioner, um, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, Commissioner Barnett. All those for, anybody against? Wait, wait, oh, wait a minute. Wait. Okay, let's hold off here now. We have a first. Do we have any comments or questions? Um, yes, we do. By uh, Vice Mayor Marino, go right ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, while I appreciate everyone wanting to add uh, staff, I don't believe at this time adding any additional staff is uh, behooves us as we are facing so many different challenges, so many different uh, budget challenges, I should say, with the shortfall we have in our capital improvement budget, um, with the possible being faced with a possible infrastructure surtax that we're going to have to pass on to our constituents. Um, I just don't think this, is, and I realize the way it reads is that it's taking seven positions from somewhere else in the county and moving them here, but then as you read further down the line, it says those seven positions will then in fact be factored back in. So um, I am not in favor of this. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have also comments. I think it was uh, Commissioner Barnett, you were next, and then uh, Commissioner Weiss. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. I um, also was not opposed to this initially, but um, my understanding is that there will not be a fiscal impact to the budget that the uh, positions are recycled from other positions in the county that have been unfilled for over a year or so. Um, I, my office does not need an additional um, commission assistant, but I don't see any reason why if there's another commissioner who does, especially in considering that um, there will not be an impact to the taxpayers, this won't be an additional um, unaccounted for budget item. I, I, I just want to make sure that with regards to the clause or any adjustments as deemed appropriate doesn't leave a window open for um, a fifth county commission assistant or a sixth. I wanted to uh, support this and I do and I will for it. I want to make sure that the cap will remain at four county commission assistants. So at this point, you may be making a motion to, uh, to modify. Uh, the I'm not making a motion at this time. I'm just asking for a, a clarification. Clarification. All right, staff, could I have a clarification? Did you, did you all hear his question? Mayor. Yes. Madam I, I did hear his question. Uh -huh. Staff cannot answer that question. That's a question for the board as far as your policy is concerned on how many positions you're going to allow uh, per commission district. At this particular item, I was directed in July to bring this item back uh, after I coordinated with the county attorney's office to ensure there was nothing that prohibit one office getting uh, assigned a position more than others. And so it was brought back that it be allowed for all county commission offices. So that is why you have one additional position being added per county commission office or any adjustment thereafter. Because if other commissioners don't want the positions, they can say they don't want them and then we end up with whatever number of positions we end up with. But staff is not in a position to cap I don't cap my boss's positions. <laughs> you tell me uh, what direction you're going in, and then we adjust the resolution to fit those needs. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I know you have some other lights on here, so I'm going to go with um, the next one, which is Commissioner Weiss. Thank you. Um, just echoing, uh, I think, similar comments to uh, Commission uh, Vice Mayor Marino. Um, I, I can, in good conscience, after we cut taxes 
and are having budget shortfalls to add additional staff to commission offices this year. So I will be voting uh, no on this item. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Now, Commissioner Baxter. Just for clarification, um, Administrator Baker, four is only what this is allowing. We would have to do another resolution to get to five. So in a sense, it is a cap. It's just not, it's saying we would have to go through the whole other process to do any more than four. But the last line from my understanding was, just clarifying and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that if we, if one, some of the commissioners do not need the fourth aid, they would just stay at three. And it gives that flexibility. Just clarifying. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Commissioner, did you hear, did everybody hear the answer? The from uh, Administrator Baker, very good. Uh, Vice Mayor Marino. Thank you, I'll say my last two cents and then I will be done. Um, the last line says, these positions will be requested to be replaced as employment conditions improve, which means that there is a fiscal impact. Um, there are also unintended fiscal impacts of this. Uh, we just spent um, some money to replace the floors up in the 12th floor if we now have if each office now has an additional person, we now have the uh, impact of what are we going to do and where are we gonna put those folks and what furniture are we going to do and what computers do we need? So while it may seem like it is only the impact of a salary, it is not. It is an infrastructure impact also, also on the 12th floor when we're worried about what we need to do on the lower floors where we service our constituents. So I, again, I, I applaud all of the administrative assistants that we have on the 12th floor. They're doing a fabulous job. Um, I just don't believe that this is a responsible uh, use of our tax dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, I have a question. Uh, reading the summary um, on the staff report, and this, I guess, is directed to you, Madam Administrator, uh, it states very clearly, and I will read, these positions were directed to be transferred from other county departments, resulting in no additional fiscal impact at this time. Now, does this mean that if we approve of this, there will be no fiscal impact today, but next week there very well could be a fiscal impact on the county? I think that Commissioner Marino um, point well made because we're going to have to provide uh, operating capital kind of things. That's the, that's the incidental cost. But to actually move the positions salary wise, there will be little to no fiscal impact when it comes to actually moving the positions. So I, don't, I have insufficient information at this time to take a vote because if I know that there won't be any fiscal impact at this time. Yet, uh, in two months, there's gonna be a big hit to our budget or that this will cost the taxpayers so much money. I need to know what that is before I can make a, a equitable decision at this time. Can we have any kind of indication as to uh, what this is gonna cost the taxpayers in the next quarter? The biggest cost is the salaries associated with these positions. Uh -huh. We are going to make those adjustments when we transfer the positions So over. there will be no additional costs. When it comes salary. to salaries, that's correct. We will look at surplus equipment uh, that we have, and if we have sufficient surplus equipment, we will utilize that surplus equipment. Any other costs associated with it, we're gonna look and work with the commissioner's office at their existing budget to cover that for this year you will not see a large increase in anything this year that we can anticipate. Now, if something is being asked for that's out of the norm, I cannot answer that question. But if it's just the transfer of the positions, we're gonna transfer the position and the appropriate funding, and we'll make those adjustments. But, and we'll look for existing furniture in surplus, so we don't necessarily have to buy new furniture. And if a commissioner wants new furniture, we're gonna to look to their budget to pay for that 
it's already in their budget. So you should not see any large increase this year. And that is why I said at this time. I see that's artfully drawn <laughs> at this time. <laughs> Let me just say that the, um, um, if a commissioner decides that they really need a fourth and the money would come from that commissioner's budget, it would not come from the taxpayer's budget, it wouldn't come from taxpayer's money. We all have so much money to run our offices. And so the money for additional costs would come from a commissioner's uh, budget, not from the taxpayer's money. Am I, am I under, because this is not, really being stated as clearly as okay. I'd like to see it. I'm sorry, but I just... All, all of our dollars are taxpayers' dollars, so uh, it, it's your budget, okay? So it comes from our, our accounts? It, it comes from the overall general fund, because you ask me to transfer positions from county departments, those seven positions possibly or less, over to the appropriate district offices. We're going to transfer those dollars needed associated with it. It's already in the budget that you approve no, for this that. year. I right. appreciate that. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. We have additional lights, uh, Commissioner Baxter and then uh, Commissioner Woodward and Weiss. Go right ahead, Commissioner. Thank you, Mayor. Is Sherry Brown here? Would you like for her to come up? She could, okay. please. Here. Oh, and again, this is the overall budget. I've been dealing with budgets since 1987 when I came to the county. So I know budgets. And so this is the general fund. We take the general fund dollars. When we come to you, it's primarily supporting all of our operations, including your offices. And so you're asking me to move positions from the county side over to your side. The resolution governs, there's a resolution that governs the number of positions and how personnel is handled it on the 12th floor, which is totally different than the staff under me. So this, I'm moving those positions from staff under me up into your into budgets. Your and we're gonna move the dollars appropriately that needs to be moved. Okay. Thank you, Administrator. Go right ahead, Commissioner Baxter. Um, I will ask, I guess, the administrator first, but the reason I had asked um, is because usually Sherry answers the emails. So uh, how much, we have 800, last we checked, we had 838 open positions in the county. How much of those dollars are funded every pay period and not spent? Or how much are funded every when pay period? When we began the fiscal year, Positions that are existing are already funded, 100%. Posi new positions that we add, we normally fund them three quarters of what they're worth. So when positions, we have taking a snapshot at any given time, there are a different number of positions. So people come, they leave, we've got new positions we're advertising for. As we all know, it's very difficult right now to hire. So, and it's also challenging to keep certain types of positions. So those positions fluctuate. That is why I looked at positions that have been vacant for at least a year. And so those are the positions that I will be choosing from. When you ask how much is associated, uh, how much Avalorum dollars fund those type positions, the majority of them is very difficult to say this position is Avalon and that because it depends upon funding coming into the general fund, which could be grant funds that's helping offset. It could be user fees that help offset, but primarily it is Avalorum that funds it. However, when you look at the general fund, the majority of those Avalorum dollars also goes to support the sheriff. Are the Positions approximately ad valorem dollars, one million per pay period that have been funded for this year? If we calculate out, yes, I think that is correct. That's so, the number we came correct. up with, mm -hmm. yes. At a later date, when it says this may hit us later, wouldn't we then have to fill a lot of those positions for this to actually give a fiscal impact? I mean, we took the, seven of 838. For this year, yes. So really, the fiscal impact that we're worried about whether it's two weeks or two months isn't, no, that's, that's not really reality because we have 
a lot of open positions. At this so time, yes. essentially, we would have to get a much closer is kind of what I'm getting at. So I don't think that fiscal impact. Um, as far as, yes, we have our own, as stated previously, our office budgets. If we needed to pay for anything for that extra person, I mean, my office personally doesn't um, need a desk. Uh, but again, we don't have to take that extra person, right? We can choose to stay at three. So I, I'm, I guess I'm just four options. I like, I don't think our districts are the same. I think we are all highly um, different districts and we represent our districts. Um, and at the end of the day, it comes down to constituent services and helping people. And I believe one more person helps people. And if we're not spending more money and able to help people, to me, that's a win-win. If we're worried about the cost of a desk when trying to make policy decisions, I, I just can't. Um, but uh, so I do appreciate being conservative and not having huge fiscal impacts. Um, but I also think that our residents are very important. So I think um, somebody had comments after me. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Commissioner Woodward, you're, represent, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so when we passed our budget for fiscal year 24, the dollar amounts that were put forth were by district with uh, the staff that we currently had and what was anticipated as far as the we had passed a cost of living raise and the expected raises that were come from those positions. So when we passed our budget, each district had a certain dollar amount that is actually going to be different from each other. But that's the budget that we passed just a few months ago. So we are having to work within the budget that we just passed. And if we do this, then we are transferring budget dollars from other departments to us, right? Is that how this would work? Which from what I, when my, I, I asked the price of this yesterday, it was approximately $75,000 with salary and the benefits package that comes with it. This would be the initial transfer to our budgets. And then what would happen in fiscal year 25? We would, we would budget um, as appropriate for personal services for four, three, whatever number of positions you have in your office with the appropriate salaries calculated. <laughs> um, and as time, as we get to the place where the positions we've eliminated on the county, on operating side, when we need those positions, I'll come back to the board during that budget process and ask you to add those positions back. So if I have a follow-up? Mm -hmm, um, go right ahead. So I asked, I know that there was the large number of unfilled positions that was put out there, but then we actually only have 35 to 40 positions that would completely qualify to transfer to us because ours comes, we have no enterprise funds, right? That is correct. Based upon the fact that I looked at how many positions had been open for almost a year or more. And then I backed out the enterprise funds because we can't, you know, we, we can't spend money. Those dollars are restricted. Uh, I also looked at union positions. We backed those out because you can't take a union position and then convert it to a non-union position. Uh, I looked and then that left a lot of our IT positions, our, our uh, tech technical positions. And so for those positions, we, util we contract for those services because it's very difficult to fill those positions. So I eliminated mm. those. And so we've got others that the remaining ones were about 35, 40 positions that I could transfer from, from those departments. So you have identified seven different departments that would be transferring a position to the BCC? I've got a pool of positions that I can take seven from, from various departments to transfer to the board, if that's your direction. And the only prerequisite right now is that it's been open for a year yes, and it's funded by, it's? Uh, yes, in this, in the general fund, yes. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Commissioner Woodward. And now, Commissioner Weiss. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think there, to me, it sounds like there's confusion, budget versus actual. This is an actual expense. 
to pay somebody a salary. It's not a budget. The budget is the plan that we put forth on what we expect to spend over the coming year. If those funds are not spent during that year, they're rolled over or used for another purpose. So by there's a real expense to these positions. It's not, it's not saying that it, if those positions stayed open for another year, that money would not be spent. It, would, it could either be returned to the taxpayer, it could be rolled over, put into another project, but to say that there's no impact, that's not accurate. Everything we do has an impact. It's where that dollars go. And at this point, I, may, I said it earlier, but I'll say it again, I think we cut the taxes. We were concerned about what things cost our taxpayers. We know we have budget shortfalls. So I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Weiss. Are there any other questions or comments by members of the board? I believe we have a first set and looking for a second. Um, Commissioner Barnett seconded. Did you? Very good. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. All right. And then we're ready for a vote. Um, I would request a roll call vote just in case. So why don't we um, be prepared for that and go right ahead, Mr. Clerk. Commissioner Bernard. Yes. Commissioner Weiss? No. Commissioner Woodward? No. Commissioner Barnett? Yes. Commissioner Baxter? Yes. Vice Mayor Marino? No. Mayor Sachs? No. Three aye, four nay. Okay, see that it fails by that vote, three to four. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, Moving right along from 5E1, going over to 5F1, A and B. Um, we have a staff report. Does anybody here wish to hear the staff report? Yes, we do. Okay. Let's go ahead and have a seat. And good morning. Good morning, Mr. Von Laren. Mayor, Commissioners, Administrator, and County Attorney. Uh, before you are um, actually two presentations that we have. Uh, these were originally going to be at a January workshop, but we uh, wanted to move them up a little bit for a couple of reasons. Um, and uh, we're excited that um, Dr. Jennifer Kopp from Florida State University School of Criminology and Criminal Justice is here with us today to present uh, some findings of an evaluation report that she prepared for the Criminal Justice Commission and that the CJC asked for that to be presented to the Board of County Commissioners um, as well. In addition, we have a 35-year snapshot and look back at the CJC uh, that Ms. Regina Herring, our Executive Director, and Dr. Rachel Dasikal, uh, the incoming chair of the CJC, uh, are here to share with us. So I know that uh, Dr. Kopp's schedule is a little bit more um, tight, so we wanted to uh, afford her the opportunity to present um, her findings to the BCC first and then go into the 35-year um, snapshot on CJC with the BCC. Very good. Welcome, Professor. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you all for having me, Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, so as you mentioned, I, uh, is, there we go, the PowerPoint's up. So um, I am an associate professor in the College of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Florida State University. And I also direct a jail research and policy institute there. And over the last several years, I've been working with the Criminal Justice Commission to evaluate different programs. And so um, I'm sure you're aware of some of the activity that's been happening over the last several years in the criminal justice system in Palm Beach County, where there's been a number of 
of strategies implemented to try and reduce the jail population. And those have focused on things like the pretrial risk assessment, expansion of pretrial supervision, and some other um, programs that have targeted specific populations. And uh, I'm going to focus specifically on this uh, program to expand pretrial supervision. Uh, the 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 need for this evaluation is is pretty straightforward. It helps sort of identify what works in the criminal justice system, so you can make decisions about how you want to allocate resources based on what's most effective. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, um, over the last few years, we've been working to look through some of these programs. I'm going to tell you a little bit about this evaluation effort and what we found. Uh, so. Historically, pretrial services in Palm Beach County was ling limited to a single level of services. And what that looked like was fairly intensive um, supervision. So weekly check-ins with supervision officers and a number of other conditions that could be uh, implemented by the judge. After September of 2017, the range of super supervisory levels was expanded to four. And so now they operate levels one through four, one being less intensive supervision, which could be monthly check-ins with those officers, and level four, which remains that intensive form of supervision that was um, implemented under the prior model. <clears throat> so the logic behind this shift uh, was that individuals could be greater served by having this greater diversity of supervisory levels, but also that this could potentially increase the share of individuals who are released pretrial. And so in evaluating the change, we wanted to try and understand um, what the impact was. And in particular, how did this change influence patterns of pretrial release? And was this change associated with pretrial failure? And when we talk about pretrial failure, we're looking at two outcomes, whether individuals are appearing in court and whether or not they're rearrested. And so first on the patterns of pretrial release, what we found in comparing the period prior to this change in September 2017 and the post-change period was that the share of individuals that were released really remained fairly stable. And so where we saw an impact was that among those individuals who were released, a greater share of individuals were being placed on pretrial supervision. And so what was happening was sort of a shift of individuals being released money bond towards uh, pretrial supervision. So what, what this means is that the, this change didn't affect the likelihood of people being released, just the mode of release for those individuals. When we looked at pretrial failure, what we found is that these changes had no effect on the likelihood of either failing to appear in court or pretrial rearrest. And so in thinking about sort of the, the consequences of this, um, there's a, a range of conclusions and, and a couple of other things to quickly highlight is that when you when we looked at the breakdown of individuals who were released SOR nearly half of those individuals released SOR after these changes were released to level four that most restrictive version and a sim and, and then a, a number 30 percent were released on level three the you know just one tier down so the vast majority of individuals that were released under this new model were still being released to the most intensive form of supervision and relatively few were being released, either SOR 1 or 2, those less intensive forms. So in effect, even though they expanded the, uh, the, different, the sort of diversity of, of intensity of supervision post this change in September 2017, they weren't really utilizing those less intensive forms. And in light of the fact of these findings that we see there wasn't an increase in pretrial failure to appear or a pretrial rearrest, it suggests that you can probably safely release some of those individuals on less, less intensive forms without seeing any impact to either court efficiency or, or public safety. And so the sort of broad conclusions from this is that these changes you know, didn't increase the number of people that were being re released pretrial, but that we are seeing a greater share of releases being sent to pretrial supervision and this had no impact on court efficiency or public safety, and that likely you could, you know, sort of greater utilize those lower levels of pretrial supervision and save some resources, right? Because those more intensive forms of supervision require more in terms of staff resources and otherwise, um, and, and you can do so without jeopardizing public safety or court efficiency. Wow. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I'm going to wait. Um, and uh, Commissioner Woodward, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, sorry, I was trying to keep up. Um, that was quick. You said that the uh, changes didn't really, or the, the change in September of 17 didn't actually see any results in, in higher ones. Do we know why they, it didn't increase? The, the, there wasn't an increase that I'm sorry. In you said in the, hold on. 
It was there wasn't an him. increase in the share of individuals released pretrial. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yeah. So the you know ultimately this comes down to the judicial decisions, and so they were not using this expansion of pretrial services to release more people. They sort of you know had made decisions about who is going to be released, and instead I think what they saw is there's a greater diversity of services. This maybe gives me more comfort in, re in releasing certain individuals on pretrial supervision. And so maybe someone that I previously would have assigned a monetary bond to, I'll release to pretrial services, right? But mm -hmm. that didn't necessarily make them change decisions about individuals that in that previous model, they wouldn't have released anyway, right? Okay. So that's been almost six years. Have, have we seen any in incremental increases in the usage of it? with the judiciary or not really? No, so so this report looks from 2017 up until, uh, it, 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 it moves forward up until nearly 2023 data. Uh, and during that period, there was no increase. And we've looked at more recent data too, and we haven't seen sort of an increase in utilization of pretrial services. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, um, Commissioner Weiss. Thank you. Um, so la uh, last summer, I was, uh, attended uh, the National Association of Counties um, conference and they were talking about, um, we had I, different, uh, some different uh, jurisdictions and one of them was Eugene, Eugene, Oregon and they had somebody from their parole because they, I guess they handle it through their county there. And one of the interesting findings they, they and I'm wondering if you all had, had looked at, at their research. So one of the findings that they found was that in fact, they, so they, the higher classified people got, um, were the ones with the direct supervision. The ones that, the lower classifieds, in fact, they had no supervision and, ver and no contact with, uh, with uh, the uh, folks over in the parole department um, because they were, expect the level was expected to be low. Well, and then in fact, what they found was in, was when they, in fact, had contact with these people, it was detrimental to them. It was interrupting their, you know, their work and, and things like that. And, and uh, so it was, it, I thought that was interesting and wonder if you, if you all looked at sort of the same thing, but it ultimately ended up with the same result, which was that they could spend more time with the people that really needed the super direct supervision instead of using their resource, their, their sca um, scant resources to be able to try and have contact with everybody. Yeah, no, that's a really important point. There's a lot of research that suggests that we need to be really careful about assigning conditions because onerous conditions can result in really deleterious outcomes. So especially for individuals that have been classified as lower risk, if you place too many conditions on them, they're actually at higher risk of being either rearrested or failing to appear in court. And so that model of less supervision is one that, you know, not only something that could potentially work here, but there's been research across the country that has validated that. And there, in a separate project, we compared um, different modes of, of pretrial release, including money bond and pretrial supervision and personal recognizance release, where, which is similar, right? They're, they're not reporting to anyone. There's no conditions on their release. And we found that individuals fared similarly across those. And so there's nothing to suggest. So the individuals that are released on their own recognizance are typically the lowest risk, but they do just as well when they're released on their own recognizance as if they're uh, assigned to minimal levels of supervision. So very similar with what they've seen in Eugene, Oregon. Hmm. Okay, are there any other questions or comments? I have a couple of questions, Professor. When you're talking about pretrial release, you're talking about uh, bond, basically. So everybody who is accused of a crime, unless they it's a first degree murder or a capital case, then they are by right uh, allowed to post bond. Is this, this is uh, so that um, we all understand what what part of the criminal process we're talking about. We're talking about pretrial release when someone is accused of a crime uh, and they have the ability or they have the opportunity to post bond. Is that correct? So not all. So yeah, these are all individuals that are pre-adjudication. So people that have been charged with a crime, not yet convicted. Not all of them have posted a monetary bond. So quite often with the supervised pretrial release, uh, there there can be a monetary bond imposed, but oftentimes they're released to pretrial services without having to post so, a monetary bond. So what you're saying, these are folks who have been accused of a crime. Mm -hmm and they have a constitutional right to post bond unless the case is a capital case 
or if they don't meet the minimum requirements of bond. That is, they have no local address, they have no way that the court can find them to, so that they can face the charges. So with, is that where we're at? With pretrial supervision, the, the, the need for some of those stipulations are a little bit different. So yes, these are- No, 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 I'm not, I, I, and I can see you're a professor. <laughs> and I probably would have taken your course at FSU. <laughs> well, let's go back. This is a time in the criminal process, criminal procedures, where someone is accused of a crime and they have the constitutional right to post bond. Right, what I'm right. saying. Right. Now, so they can get off, uh, get off, in other words, not have to post a bond if they qualify for ROR or pretrial release. Correct? Right. Okay, good. So what you're saying is that the study that you did, which is impressive, is that if somebody has, is allowed to leave the courtroom without having to post a monetary bond, or surety bond, they can on pretrial release. If they have more restrictions, it doesn't help them to return back to the court to face the charges. Is that basically what you're That's saying? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I'm looking at page 11. Oh, wait a minute, is it? Yes, it is page 11. Amazing what glasses will do, isn't it? So on page 11, you have a figure S1, probability of pretrial failure by SOR levels. And on the very bottom it has, FTA, which is failure to appear, which is what bond just makes sure that the person comes back to court, right? It is, it is, it is the court's uh, sort of guarantee that the person will return. If they, do, we don't have to have, it, they don't have to post a bond, they can do pretrial release. Mm -hmm. However, what you're saying is there, uh, is that the more restrictions we put on the pretrial release, the little bit of a higher probability is that they will not come back to court. Yeah, so these increases are ever so slight, right? So well, it's very slight whether they, whether we keep an eye on them with supervision. Right. Or put an ankle bracelet, is that part of the supervision? It can be a condition imposed Could by the judge. It could be a condition. So a very little difference between somebody who is released, pre-trial release, um, and with no, with no contact with the Office of Probation, or those who have a greater uh, contact requirement with the Office of Probation. That's right. So what are you saying today? That we don't need these restrictions or we do? So that the person comes back to court, which so, is what it's all about. Yeah, I mean, you know, one sort of counter argument is that uh, the, the judges are really doing a great job of classifying individuals on the basis of risk and that those individuals that are classified in levels three and four require some more intensive supervision to maintain these relatively low levels sure. of, of, uh, of uh, re-arrest or pretrial failure to appear. So what I would say is that a diversity of options is better than the old model of only one single intensive level of supervision, but that at the same time, you could probably expand your use of those lower levels. So I'm not saying that across the board, everyone should be le release without conditions, but I am saying that there are likely individuals that are currently being placed in higher levels of supervision than would be necessary to ensure their pretrial compliance. Okay. Commissioner Woodward. Thank you. Um, so there's four levels of, of this that are put in here. Do we happen to know the financial impact of, of using each level to the county? I don't have anything on the budget of the pretrial services office. We don't Could have. Could you please identify yourself? Thank oh, you. Regina Herring, I'm the Executive Director of the Criminal Justice Commission. Okay, very good. Thank um, you. No, we don't have those numbers. That um, pretrial services actually falls under public safety. Stephanie Shanaha is the director there. Um, she's in the audience. Um, but she could probably, I'm not sure on the, on the heels of right now, be able to tell you, but that falls within her shop. What we do is just evaluate its impact. Good morning. So good after, or good morning, uh, Stephanie Shanahan, Director of Public Safety. So the levels of supervision don't really correlate to our budget. Our budget off, um, is, includes um, approximately 20 something positions. Um, it's, a, it's about $2 million a year. Uh, we have pretrial service counselors and interviewers, but the level of supervision doesn't necessarily correlate to our budget amount. Um, so de depending on uh, what the judge assigns to the individual, um, we wouldn't have an amount associated with that. But we, can we make the assumption that the lower level of supervision would yes, be less cost? Yes, less cost associated um, with uh, the amount of um, resources that we would have to apply to that individual, whether it's 
uh, reporting calling in or reporting in person. That would definitely require less resources on our part. So as I'm understanding the report, then you're having that we did not see an increase in failures by using this, and we're not really seeing an increase necessarily in, you know, either way, but the financial impact, we probably could definitely feel ourselves with having less supervision required for people who do get released by the judge if he's making an accurate assessment and, you know, doing this. It, are we saying that this is being successful right now? I mean, <laughs> sorry, I'm... Well, I think we can. What we can say is, um, right now, it's it's the one and two. The lower levels are underutilized based on the data. Um, and if we were to look at utilizing, we could um, perhaps save some um, tax dollars. But you know, because we haven't seen an, an increase in failure to appears as a result. So that's kind of what this research is telling us. Um, and all we can do is say, you know, maybe. Um, influence maybe have, and I only always look at piloting and testing to see if it works, um, to see how we can work with judiciary, the judiciary to see if we can um, test it and see if we utilize those lower levels, what's that impact. But And this is all strictly in the pretrial phase, right? This is all at the front end of the system, yes. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> if I may, a couple of questions. Um, did you check with the um, uh, with the judicial uh, board at all, with any of the judges as to why they, uh, or the state attorney's office, because it's up to the state attorney's office to request bond, no bond, or pretrial services. Uh, and what did they say? Yeah, so in separate projects, we've had conversation with judges, and their response, quite frankly, makes a lot of sense, is that individuals, if they were considering uh, releasing someone on levels one or two, less intensive supervision, quite likely they would release that person on personal recognizance, right? Oh, wow. Exactly, and so that's why they're not relying right. so heavily. And so the, our counter argument to that is, well, you are releasing a lot of people on level three and four that look quite similar to folks that are being assigned levels one and two. Perhaps you could consider uh, you know, releasing them to mm -hmm. less intensive forms of supervision. Um, but that was, their, that, that was their argument, that if they're considering less intensive forms, then they would opt for personal recognizance release. ROR, okay. Mm -hmm. and, the, um, and how about the state attorney's office? I haven't had specific conversations with the state attorney's office about Although this. Although it is up to the state attorney to say, this person should not be released ROR based on our findings or evidence, or this person needs um, more um, increased supervision if he's, if he's uh, pretrial release, PTR. That's right, yeah. They would make okay. those recommendations in first appearance, yeah. Right, and so you haven't checked with them as to what their uh, recommendations are? No, no. What we did was this was presented to the Criminal Justice Commission in full, and, you know, as a part of that body is the state attorney and the public defender. So you'll get both sides of that so argument. So what have we, we heard? Presented. Have, have they, I understand your research. Yeah. Do we have the research from the charging uh, agency, which is the state attorney's office, as to whether they comply or they would like to comply with your findings? Well, there was no um, specific um, direction to the state attorney or the public defender. They are part of the full body. And when we presented this to the full CJC, there was no opposition or no comment against it. So I would like to see it sent to the state attorney's office for them. They have a, a whole office. Uh, on this issue, and I think it's important. I don't know who's represented by PD and the state attorney in the CJC, but we do have an entire office right across Dave, the street. Dave it Ehrenberg sits on our, on our okay. board. Okay, well, he has an office mm -hmm. just dedicated to this. I'd like to see their opinion. I'd also like to see the opinion of the criminal law section of the Florida Bar. Have we sent this study to them? Obviously, it's a good study. Um, has it been sent to the criminal law section? No. Typically what we do with our studies is um, we review them in-house um, because, you know, the board consists of 32 members, and many of those are public sector um, officials, uh, heads of agencies, and they weigh in. And we didn't get any opposition to bring it to this board because we're your advisors, the Board of County Commissioners. So all of our research and, and opinions and whatever comes to this body to advise you, we do place it on our website so that it's open to the public for the public well, to be able to view that. in. Mm -hmm. um, but that's pretty much to the extent we do have representation from the national, from the floor, um, Palm Beach County Bar. So um, was it the law? 
Criminal Law Association sit criminal on the law board. Association Some sits on the board. Okay, um, Commissioner Wood, uh, Bernard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, just follow, following on your question, Mayor, I just wanted to find out kind of like how do we take a proactive approach to working with the judiciary, the state attorney, the public defender, or the bar? And you know, what were their comments at the CJC? Did they have any comments? And so in that way, we can make informed decisions. Well, there were, like I said, there was no, that, that I can recall was any opposition. Um, it, was, it came at the recommendation of the board to bring it to the Board of County Commissioners so that you all can hear, see the report and hear the report um, and make uh, an informed decision of where you want us, what direction you'd like to see us um, head with this. Um, as, as we mentioned, you know, it is, it is a decision of the judiciary to decide what levels and where they place individuals. And the state attorney weighs in at, at hearing, at the hearing, whether or not they oppose to whichever. Um, but we pilot it going, as, as the professor said, from one um, option to four options. And that was um, in agreement with the judiciary and the state attorney and the public defender for us to do that. Um, and so what we're doing is seeing how effective is that going from a one size fits all to four options. And as a result, what we've, saw, what we've seen is people, the judiciary state more on the higher end versus the lower end. It's gonna probably take time to get used to it, but I think um, our, our hope is that we will be able to meet with them and there will be some discussion. There'll be some, for me, I'm saying maybe we test it in one, one division, but I'm not sure if that works, um, a criminal division to see uh, if we were to try this and how does it work, but again, it's gonna be a discussion with the judiciary and we can bring it back to them and I talked to Dr. Kopp about that option, so we'll see and see. Can come back to you with what their thoughts are on that. So I'm trying to understand. <laughs> well. I heard nothing. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, well, I know, but I'm, I, I just don't know where do we go from this and what are the steps that we take? And I, I'm trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, so um, Commissioner, what I might suggest is, and, and this was presented as well to the, to the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Judge of, of the uh, court, and what we can do is take this report and have some follow-up conversations um, with them, um, and, and we wanted to present it today. CJC had asked us to bring this to the BCC um, as they do periodically some of the research that they do. Um, obviously, you know, the body of the CJC is one that researches these issues and comes up with, you know, some conclusions and, and ideas, sometimes recommendations, but from this perspective, if, if you know, you receive and file this and then direct us to send this to the criminal um, law section of the Florida Bar to have some follow-up conversations with the state attorney, public defender, mm -hmm. and uh, the courts. Um, we can do that and, and bring this over to them and have some additional discussions with them. Mm -hmm. One of the things that the chief judge is very good about uh, during CJC um, is listening to every recommendation and every report and then making it very well known that he will take that under advisement. I mean, that's usually as far <laughs> as the chief judge opines at CJC, and he's very consistent with that, but um, he was there. He um, uh, listened to, to this and um, certainly you know, ex explained, as he normally does, that he would take it under advisement, but we're happy to do some follow-ups um, as well with the courts and state attorney and public defender on this. And I'll just follow up. Uh, yeah, Madam go Mayor. right ahead, Since, yeah, Commissioner. You know, Commissioner Barnett, you're our representative on the CJC. Uh, you know, if you're able to, you know, once we make a decision on receiving and filing this, and to work with the CJC to see what are the best ways to work with the judiciary, the state attorney, or the public defender. And so in that way, uh, you know, you can represent us on the CJC on this. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, Commissioner Bernard. Um, the um, only thing I'd like to add is the, I think, as you said, Mr. Von Laren, uh, check it out with the Judiciary State Attorney's Office, Public Defender's Office, also with the Criminal Law Section of the, of the uh, Florida Bar because they are attorneys practicing and specializing in criminal law, defense, and prosecution. 
and this is something they should know. I just want to note one thing is that if somebody gets more restrictions on a pretrial release, it's usually because their contact with the community is less than someone who has no restrictions. And the reason he's wearing a bracelet or you know, ankle bracelet, or he has to check in all the time, is because we need to have a little more control and supervision over that person. We don't want to put him in jail. We don't want to, we trust him, but he needs a little more, he or she needs a little more support on the outside. That is the one person who will probably, will have a little more problems with in terms of uh, FTA. So I, I, I really applaud your work in this. Uh, and uh, and I think that the little more um, little more reflection by those parties who use this more often uh, uh, would be very well uh, you know very well received. So at this point, I think what we can do is uh, receive and file as you have uh, presented to us with the recommendation that you. Uh, also get the influence, and not just sitting at a table. I've been in the CJC, so you know, sometimes the coffee is not that uh, strong and <laughs> you forget maybe the, to say something, but also with the, uh, the as we stated before. Okay. Thank you. Excellent feedback and excellent direction, and we will do that and report back to you on some of those follow-ups that we very, have. Very, very good. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. Um, Madam Mayor, if we might go into the brief 35-year historical snapshot of the next presentation and we've kind of we, we provided with you the 35 year snapshot report but we've we've narrowed that down a little bit to just focus on some highlights that we very briefly want to go over with you and, and Dr. Nadasco um, please. Very good go right ahead. Good morning. Uh, I am Dr. Rachel Dosicol. I am the incoming chair of the CJC as of uh, January. Uh, Madam Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Madam Administrator, and I'd like to just say a, a special hello to Commissioner Barnett, who serves on our executive committee. Thank you so much. Uh, never misses a meeting. Uh, and if it is because of you that we now have Dunkin' Donuts coffee, which is it's not, okay. Very good. not uh, weak, we appreciate it. Um, in 1987, uh, with the gathering in Miami, uh, Palm Beach County became one of fewer than two dozen uh, communities across the United States to have a CJC, a Criminal Justice Commission. And in speaking to George Elmore and a few of the original members who started the, the CJC, what they said that they wanted to do was achieve communication. That's exactly what this group is talking about this morning. How do we ensure that these different components of our criminal justice <coughs> system talk to each other, collaborate, and ensure that we're doing what is best for our community, but also those individuals who are accused of crimes? So uh, fast forward many, many years, and what we have today uh, is a system that has had a tremendous number of accomplishments over the last 35 years. Um, Executive Director? Okay. Um, and that's just to, to highlight just a few because, as you know, and, and Mayor, you realize the CJC has done a lot of work over these 35 years. And just a few of the po uh, projects that we do and what the CJC does is we pilot and um, have done so a number of signature projects. Uh, we didn't see this one that we've done. It's been around, um, it had been around for over a decade, um, working in, in low-income communities uh, to weed out, seed, weed out the crime and seed in um, uh, crime prevention strategies. Community court was one. Uh, Reentry, which is still around. It was one of the projects we piloted, and it's now in public safety, and it's still um, um, a project that the county is sustaining. Um, the d domestic violence coordinated um, community response. That is, again, a project that's still operating, and we're working through public safety, our um, victim services, um, to help uh, create a coordinated response for um, intimate and um, domestic violence. Aware and Care is a, um, a website that the county now publishes. It's out. Uh, it's really a uh, brainstorm of our law enforcement planning council, uh, the coordination of, of um, that team, 
and our behavioral health system to be able to respond to the Marjorie, Do um, Marjorie Douglas Stoneman, is that how to, yeah, Marjorie, Marjorie, Marjorie yeah. Douglas Stoneman MSD um, is tragedy right. that happened, MSD, yeah, um, that occurred, and it really helps our community to understand the issues, the um, uh, how to identify some of the symptoms and signs. Um, we also, um, Civil Drug Court, although that was a Judge Rogers uh, brainchild, we supported the development of that project and it is still running today. We also conduct research and evaluation. As you see, Dr. Kopp is one. We partner with FSU as well <coughs> as FAU. And we have a number of um, evaluations in the pipeline now for us to look at um, the front end of the criminal justice system, also the intersection between behavioral health and criminal justice. So those are some of the things that you'll see. We've also, uh, as a part, we pilot what we call Palm Fuse, and we also have a Next Step um, project that's in play. And as a result of that research, what we found is stabilization um, really helps to keep people out of the system, individuals with behavioral health, um, mental health substance use issues. But housing is the challenge, as you all know. Um, and so we've uh, also, one of the projects that we received a NACO award for is our probation bus. We recently got an award um, for that project. Um, we did um, recently a sequential intercept mapping and in that we brought in about 70 some odd uh, professionals across disciplines of law enforcement, behavioral health, uh, corrections, and we wanted to look at the gaps. What are the gaps in our system <clears throat> and how do we um, plug in those holes and what out of that 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 project is we came up with four um, um, priorities housing was number one um, that we found that we really need to stabilize individuals if we're going to make an impact in um, reducing crime across the county um, legislative um, community engagement is another one of our um, tiers in which we look at and we um, implemented CJC, the very first Citizens Criminal Justice Academy. I'm not sure how many of you participated, but it really is an education um, of our community to understand the system. And we typically have around 30 to 40 citizens each academy to participate. When COVID hit, we had over 100 and some odd folks participate online um, with that project. We did our community policing um, forums. We did those across the county, <clears throat> um, and what we did, and that was a result of the George Floyd uh, tragedy, and we did a, a survey of our law enforcement agencies across the county on what their response is to um, chokeholds, their response to diversity, their response to um, um, uh, requiring officers to respond in, in situations such as the George Floyd situation. And what we found is our law enforcement across the county was doing a pretty good job. Um, at the time where we probably was least is the uh, body worn cameras, but now with the sheriff on board, that has brought us up um, to be more than it was like 50%. We're probably more around 80% now. The smaller agencies are the ones that we find do not have um, the body cams because it's a bit expensive. Um, we also um, work at leg, um, legislative advocacy um, where we, there are a lot of issues that we advocate uh, legislatively. There's a number of um, issues that pending that we deal with. If you can see the combat um, auto theft ordinance there um, recently there was one we supported the Florida Highway Patrol. They implemented a, um, a legislation to stop all of the wheelies and the um, um, three wheelers on the highways and on the roadways and, and, and intersecting traffic. We participated in that and stand your ground and Palm Beach County was one of the initial counties to do the ban the box. So that was um, uh, a really the work of the CJC in a quick snapshot. Thank you so much. Um, any questions or comments by members of the board? I have just a few. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Some of the things that when you come back and talk to us, some of the things uh, I'd like to have you uh, review. First, I want to congratulate um, the CJC and Carrie Hogwatt on the reentry program. Uh, once somebody is, and this is, you know, when somebody is, uh, is sentenced to the Department of Corrections, it's a state, that state jurisdiction. When they come, if they live in Palm Beach County, they are, have the opportunity to have the reentry program. And I'd like to see more work done, more focus on that reentry program for, uh, for any uh, convicted felons who return back home, that we can help them. Secondly, with that reentry program, you talk about housing. 
I want to be sure, and I don't know the answer to this, but in our affordable housing, workforce housing, will we allow a convicted felon to live? And I think that this is important because part of what we do as a county is to make sure that uh, folks re-entering re into our community have a safe place to live. And I wanna make sure that um, our, our housing requirements for workforce housing will allow certain members of our re-entry population to come back and live. Um, second, secondly, the human trafficking advocates. Uh, there are many people who are arrested on prostitution or solici solicitation of prostitution, and we don't know whether or not they were a victim of human trafficking. I know that, uh, that Dave Ehrenberg's office needs some, probably some assistance and people to advocate for these folks to, to help them uh, become, go from being a defendant to a victim. And I think that would be a very good uh, 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 initiative for our CJC. And I'm also looking at Commissioner Barnett because he's writing this all down right now too. Mm -hmm. The drug court that we had in the city of Del Rey, where we had teens who were charged with uh, small amounts of, um, of drugs were prosecuted by other teens and defended by and judged as a, by a jury of other teens. And it worked out extremely well. I wanna make sure that that continues. I believe it was Judge Happily um, uh, who started it. Could be wrong, but I know a, no, a number of the judges there support that and it's an excellent, excellent idea to keep our young people uh, out of jail. And of course the Veterans Court. Make sure that we keep and maintain that veterans court here in West, in Palm Beach County for the veterans uh, to assist them in getting through a lot of the issues that they do. Thank you for all you do. I have a light on by Commissioner Bardet, our representative. Go right ahead, sir. Thank you very much, Madam Mayor. I wanna thank all of you leaders on the Criminal Justice Commission and congratulations to you, Rachel, President-elect or Chair-elect uh, for the coming year. It's um, been a, a highlight of mine to serve on this Criminal Justice Commission to take over after Commissioner David Kerner and to continue serving in this very important position on the CJC and I'm grateful, Madam Mayor, that you've uh, uh, saw fit to allow me to continue for the next year on the Criminal Justice Commission. Absolutely. I came to the County Commission and the CJC with uh, uh, priorities that were personal to me that involve matters of criminal justice, seeing that I kind of lived some of these issues this past year and in years prior with family members who experienced what it's like to re-enter society after having spent uh, months in jail and in rehab, um, seeing how um, th there are gaps in the system. Unfortunately, he was not able to be helped, but I learned a lot myself um, with the lived experience, but also with what you were able to teach me as a member of the Criminal Justice Commission. Um, I also wanted to point out another highlight I didn't see in the abbreviated uh, slideshow um, that um, pertains more to the internal composition of the CJC membership. This year we had an ordinance change that allowed for greater diversity on the Criminal Justice Commission to include uh, representative from the Hispanic Chamber, the Black Chamber, other organizations. We have, um, I believe, our first, maybe not the first, but first in a long time, Hispanic uh, member of the Criminal Justice Commission, Maria Antonia, added a few months ago, and I'm grateful to you, Rachel, and um, Michelle, and the other members of the Economic Council who worked so hard with us to make that happen. It meant a lot to me, uh, personally, representing Commission District 3, which has such a large um, population of Hispanic, um, uh, from uh, Hispanics from all over Central, South, and uh, America and the Caribbean. Did you, did you want to say something? I did. I just wanted to note your leadership on that issue and thank you for that. That was uh, really tremendous. I appreciate you very much for saying that. Thank you. And um, um, actually, the item was brought to my attention very early on by one of my commission assistants who's actually no longer my commission assistant, but he's sitting in the room in the back. Um, a very good friend, Mr. Dave Bernhardt, sitting in the back in his uh, FHP uniform. Just want to give you a shout out. Thank you, sir, 
for your leadership as well on that. Um, but um, that, was, that meant a lot. I think it was a huge accomplishment for the CJC, and I give all the credit to mm -hmm. the members of the board, its leadership, its chair, and um, I'm glad I'm going to be serving with you, Rachel, on the CJC as you uh, continue as chair. But I also wanted to uh, thank you, uh, Regina, for uh, the opportunity to serve with you on this board and all that you've done as executive director, and you're not going to be executive director after it's December 22nd, which makes me very sad. But I know you're going to be doing much bigger and better things, so that it makes me happy. Great. <laughs> so I appreciate you, and I thank you. Um, that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. We, okay, we, we have a motion by uh, Commissioner Weiss to receive and file, second by Commissioner Woodward. All those for it, anybody opposed, see that it passes unanimously. Now we're going to hear from Administrator Baker. I just wanted to publicly thank Regina for all the work that she's accomplished uh, since she's been our uh, executive director of CJC. Uh, we had some tumultuous times that we had to deal with. Uh, she was able to work with our police departments along with the sheriff's office, uh, working with our community. We've got a couple of other things still we're working on. Uh, and so we'll continue that work after she's gone. She's definitely laid a very good foundation for us. So I want to wish her well in her next chapter and to thank her for all the hard work, her and her thank staff. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, thank you. Okay, um, looking now at, uh, on page 64, is this a possible delete on 5G1? And I'm looking at uh, the clerk, or should we go ahead and proceed with this? Yes, it passed unanimously. Passed unanimously, yes, thank you. Um, looking at 5G1. Are we going to proceed on this, or is this a delete? Yes. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, looking at 5G1, Palm Tram. Uh, do we, oh, good. Who we have? Do we wish to hear a staff report? Anybody? No? Seeing um, no interest right there. That's good. If, do we have a, a first to approve, a motion to approve uh, the 5G1A, B, and C? Okay, we have uh, Commissioner Barnett, a second by Commissioner. Oh. I have a comment. Okay, then hold it. Second by Commissioner Weiss. Um, and can you hold the comment till after the vote, or would you like to? It's in pertaining to this item. Okay, good. Go right ahead. So you're recognized. For clarification for myself and the board, when did we receive the backup for this item? That of 557 pages. The, the posting of this, so the contract for this was posted, I believe, and I don't know exact date, but it was either late last week or sometime, um, um, and I'm not, I'm not certain exactly when it was posted, but I believe that we had the initial draft that was up last week, mm -hmm. and then the final that was um, replaced it um, either Friday or, or yesterday morning. It says- contract. <laughs> It was uploaded and made available to us yesterday. And we've had pretty firm conversations about not getting information, especially 557 pages of information when we're voting on something the next day. Um, I'm sure you enjoy your girls, <laughs> as I do my children. And so um, I'm just pointing this out that once again, we are receiving this much information the day before. So I just really appreciate um, getting that a lot sooner. Understood. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner uh, Vice Mayor Marino. I totally agree. And if this weren't an emergency, we'd be pulling this today. Understood. Thank you. We'll, we'll be more diligent about getting that sooner to you. All right, are there any other questions or comments about this issue? I believe we have a first and a second. Uh, do we need a roll call or are we all, I think, um, everybody uh, approve? Anybody disapprove? See that it passes unanimously, uh, seven to zero. 
Thank you very much. Okay, we have an add-on, um, and I think we have some folks here uh, with regard to that. Let me make that. It is 5H1, um, and uh, it is an add-on. Um, thank you very much. I saw you sitting there in the back of the room. Good to see you all. Um, we would like, and Ms. Baker, why don't you go ahead and I'd tell like us. to start because I've heard this board time and time again, and I agree with you. We definitely need backup in sufficient time. Um, I am working on a new procedure, new standard that we're going to be following. Uh, and so you will get, if you don't have the final when it comes in initially, you will have a draft of that final. Uh, but for today, this particular item is extremely late. I would never bring this type item to you unless, you know, we were caught in a time crunch, uh, an opportunity that we did not want to miss in promoting and marketing our county and keeping our name up front with PGA Tour. Uh, and so we, are, we took this before the TDC last Thursday. Uh, and I, this was my opportunity to bring it before you today. This will be for the tournament uh, that begins late February. I want to say February 26th. It runs through the early part of March. The advertisement will start, and we want to keep Palm Beach County's brand in the midst of it. So if you would not mind, I'd, I'd like for staff uh, to introduce, our, Emmanuel to introduce our guest. Uh, and then to do a presentation, a quick presentation, so that you understand what we're purchasing for $1.2 million. Very good, good. Mayor, thank Vice you. Vice Mayor, members of the board, County Attorney, my, Madam Baker, I'm Emmanuel Perry, Executive Director of the Tourist Development Council, and I would like to introduce um, my colleagues who's sitting with me, starting from left to right. Um, we have the Executive Director of the Palm Beach County Sports Commission with George Lindley. We have Mr. Ken Kennerly, former, former Executive Director of the Honda Classic, I have with me to my right Miss um, Liz Herman of the County Attorney's Office. Then I have Mr. Joey Chipman, Chipwood, um, Interim Executive Director of the tournament. And last but not certainly not least, the Discover, Discover the Palm Beaches President and CEO, Mr. Milton Segarra. Um, so before the board, we're seeking a recommendation uh, in consideration of approval for an agreement for the between the Palm Beach County and the PGA Tour for a sponsorship opportunity of a golf tournament formerly known as the Honda Classic. Um, this position will be able to put the Palm Beach County front and center and be able to market our destination that we call home, um, being able from, from TV advertisement, from namership, viewership, and... Uh, being able to go into great detail. Um, we do apologize to getting this agreement um, before you at the last minute, but um, things are moving quickly on the outside, so we didn't want to miss this opportunity to capitalize as it relates to being able to put our destination front and center. And I will allow Mr. Ken Kenley if you want to chime in. Thank you, Emmanuel. Thank you, Emmanuel. Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, uh, Administrator Baker, thank you for uh, having us this morning. Uh, as Emmanuel mentioned, this is an uh, extremely important opportunity for, for the county. I'm a longtime resident of Palm Beach County. The uh, professional golf, as you may or may not know, has been going on for many, many years. Arnold Palmer won the West Palm Beach Open in 1959. Fast forward, we've had Ryder Cups, PGA Championships, 12 senior PGA Championships, 18 Honda Classics, and announced earlier this morning the Cognizant Classic. Uh, was announced at 8 o'clock this morning. What we're talking about today is um, a unique opportunity for the destination for the Palm Beaches. It is a presenting sponsorship. It is something that the PGA Tour does not do, as Joey will, will, um, um, will agree. Uh, we, we have received approval from the PGA Tour for the Palm Beaches to be regarded as a destination, not a commercial entity. The PGA Tour does not have a title and a presenter in the lockup logo, in the logo that you will see on television that will be pro projected around the world. So we have this unique opportunity. So what you're going to find is this, this property will be called the Cognizant Classic in the Palm Beaches. The in the Palm Beaches will be in the font. The logo is being uh, developed as we speak and will be released as soon as Cognizant approves. Um, but it's a very unique opportunity. The PGA Tour is televised over 200 countries around the world. 
the uh, impact, the media impact measured by the PGA Tour is in excess of $200 million in economic impact and, and media rights and digital rights across the board from NBC to Golf Channel, ESPN Plus, et cetera. Um, and what, what, again, will be in the lockup logo. It, it's going to be, remember, the Honda Classic was just the Honda Classic. The logo of the tournament is Cognizant Classic in the Palm Beaches. So in the Palm Beaches is receiving equal treatment to the title sponsor of this great event. So with that, I, I appreciate um, your, 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 uh, your time this morning and uh, certainly available for any questions. Vice Mayor Marino, she is, by the way, I want you to understand that she's our golfer here on the board, so her weight carries a lot uh, with us. So uh, buckle your seatbelts, uh, folks. Go right ahead, Vice Mayor. Well, I think before we, uh, since we, does anybody have questions? So no, you're the, you have, you're the only light on. So as, the, as a longstanding uh, ambassador with the Honda Classic, um, this event is important to the Palm Beaches. Uh, just the revenue that's generated, the room nights, the restaurants, the car rentals, the, the impact um, is, we try to measure it, but really is immeasurable. And the, um, the nonprofit component of it is also important to the community. And Joey and I have had a conversation about that. Um, we want to make sure to maintain that there is a nonprofit component, and I know that they've signed um, an agreement to such. So um, if it would be okay with the rest of the board, I would love to make a motion that we uh, approve an agreement with the PGA Tour to include Palm Beaches in the branding of this. We have a second by Commissioner Barnett, who must also be a golfer. Are there any other questions or comments before uh, we proceed to a vote? Very good, all right. Uh, all those for, anyone against? C uh, Madam Baker, do you want? I'm not against it. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> but I, I, I need to verify because we were waiting for the insurance uh, certificate to come in showing us as additional insured. Did we receive that yet? I've not gotten the email yet, other than they are getting it from risk right now. So I'd expect we would have that by the end of today. So I would. Do I need to respectfully my request that the board, yes, that you uh, approve it contingent upon receiving uh, the insurance certificate with? I'll make a motion that, that we approve contingent on receiving the insurance certificate. And the second is the same, Commissioner Barnett? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Very good. That's okay. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about pretrial release, you got it. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, we're going to have another vote. Uh, all those for it? Anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously, uh, seven to zero. And as chair of the TDC, I'm just so proud of y'all. This is a tremendous, tremendous push and an advancement of the name Palm Beach County, which I think is gonna go throughout the, uh, throughout the country and throughout the world. I just have one question. Can our vice mayor play in this uh, Honda Classic uh, in Palm Beach? And I also want my lanyard that says cognizant of the Palm Beaches. Because I, I used to wear the, I wore the Honda one for as, as long as I sat here. So, thank you so much, Mr. Perry, for uh, bringing this forward. Mr. Scarra, all of you, good to see you, Mr. Lindley. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Very good. Okay. <clears throat> Moving right along, we're now on um, page 65, which is 6A Commission District Appointments. Yes, Commissioner Woodward. Oh, none at this time. <laughs> No, at this time. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have done the um, the uh, boards and commission assignments by district commissioners, and does anybody have any? Oh well, here we are. Um, let's see. Um, I just saw. Was that Bernard? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bernard. Okay. Could we have him stay for uh, Commander Major General Bernhard. Bernhard? When you get a minute, I wonder if you could just come on back for a few minutes, if that's okay? Okay, sounds good. Um, okay, uh, going to my right, uh, any, any commissioner appointments? Okay, Commissioner Bernard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'd like to appoint, reappoint Sherry Alberry to the Library Advisory Board. Very good. Commissioner Marino. 
Thank you. I would like to reappoint Lisa Seymour to the Library Advisory Board, and I would like to reappoint Steve Brockoff to the Sports Commission. Thank very you. Good. Thank you very much. Any other lights? Any other appointments at this time? Seeing none? Okay, very good. All right, moving right along. Uh, staff comments, administration. Just like to remind everyone of the Boca Bowl on Thursday afternoon and evening and also the luncheon on tomorrow and then to wish everybody a uh, happy holidays okay. thank you so much um speaker um county attorney i would like to wish everybody happy holidays as well and that's it thank you um now going on to commissioner comments we're going to start uh with um to my left with uh, commissioner barnett Do you want me to start? I can. Would you? All right. I'll tell you what. We'll come back to uh, Commissioner Barnett. Uh, yes, Commissioner Woodrick, go right ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first, I would like to request um, offsite approval for a proclamation uh, honoring Boca Raton Airport's 75th anniversary on January 19th. Very nice. Second by Commissioner Weiss. All those four. Anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously. Thank you. And uh, also, I will be at the Boca Bowl at FAU this week. Hopefully, we have wonderful weather after last week. Uh, and I hope everyone has a wonderful, we're at only at Christmas now, I do believe. So Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Very nice. Thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Weiss. Thank you. Um, let's see. I am requesting, uh, or would like to make a motion to request an offsite uh, Proclamation declaring January 2024 as Art and Nature Inspiring Conservation Month. Very nice. Oh. We have a second by uh, Commissioner Woodward. Did you want to? Is that? Did you want to say anything more about that? Okay. Um, all those for? Anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously. Commissioner Weiss, go right ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you all or your off, you and your offices received a memo from me this morning uh, regarding. Uh, it's HB uh, 259, SB 270. This is a bill uh, by our uh, both uh, state representative, Catherine Waldron, state senator, uh, Lori Berman. This is in response to the issue, uh, issue we had with two people uh, this past year being shot while um, on their property, but bullets coming from their neighbor's property. And as we learned, there is, was, no protection uh, for those individuals or no ability for law enforcement. So they filed this bill and I'd like to request uh, that we uh, add this to our legislative uh, list of priorities so that our, our folks can uh, back us up on that. Very good, thank you. Commissioner Baxter, you're recognized. Thank you, Mayor. I spoke with um, Representative Waldron and when she was explaining it to me, there was not enough definition, not enough to find. It was very open-ended. It said if any stray bullet, regardless of consequences, leave, left their property, resulting in something. I think I want to protect our residents. Um, I think maybe putting in standards for a berm might be a better way to approach that, or um, you know, having the state materials, height, width, whatever that looks like, um, to prevent our neighbors from being impacted but there are too many unknowns and I feel that this is too broad for us the board to support changing gun laws in the state um, and on a side note I don't know that it'll really go anywhere <laughs> once it gets up there um, but no I, I don't um, I think there I do want to support our neighbors I just don't like the, the this approach by it Thank you, Commissioner so Baxter. Let me, I should add, I was, I've, I've been informed that, uh, and thank you for your comments, Commissioner. I've been informed this has support of our uh, sheriff, uh, Sheriff Bradshaw, and this is, uh, as we know, uh, people have been have been hit in our county. It's only a matter of time, unfortunately, before, uh, and my understanding is it's happening around the state. Also, uh, livestock have been hit uh, with these bullets, and when approached, a neighbor approached another neighbor asking them to please uh, redirect their uh, bullets or do something to protect, uh, protect them, they were told to go F off. 
instead of doing the neighborly thing, which would have been, oh, absolutely be happy to take my target practice away from your property. So um, I, don't, I don't understand why uh, this is a private property rights issue where somebody doesn't have to have somebody else's bullets coming onto their property. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Weiss. Uh, Commissioner Barnett. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I agree with Commissioner Weiss. This is a common sense protection. I, I'm still shocked that it's not a crime um, that we have to lobby the legislator to protect property rights, and it is not a gun issue, as you said. It is a property rights issue. If I picked up a rock in my yard and threw it across the fence and hit somebody in the head, I'd be prosecuted for battery or whatever else. But the same doesn't apply if you turn the rock into a bullet. We already had a, a woman come and uh, talk about her own experience having been hit in the back on her own property, doing nothing. It was posted, her injury was posted on the front page of the Palm Beach Post, I believe. Um, it makes sense. This is not a partisan issue. It shouldn't be. I think there's bipartisan support for this. Um, I certainly support it, and I think this Board of County Commissioners should support a very common sense and much needed protection for people standing on their own properties doing nothing. It's not a gun issue. It's a private property issue. Um, thank you, that's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner Barnett. Commissioner Woodward, you're rep recognized. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I Actually, I got the bill this morning and I just wanted to know for clarification, this would be a law enforcement issue, not like a code enforcement or code violation. This is not, would not be on the county to. Law enforcement, it would make it a misdemeanor. So, okay. So, is, so is we'll get more information here, well, I, from I our legislators. I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Is there someone here from Commissioner, uh, just uh, Representative Waldron's? No. Or Mr. Ta uh, Bonlair? I don't know. Is oh, What does it say at the end? What is it says it's it, a misdemeanor. Oh, so it wants to create a crime. It will create a misdemeanor. It will create a crime. Okay. Yeah. yeah that's important. Then. Yeah. Okay. State crime. Yeah. It, it, it amends the portion of, of statute that deals with this as a misdemeanor and then it includes additional language on the one and quarter acre properties to be if a, if a, a bullet it goes beyond the boundaries of that area, then somebody would commit a misdemeanor based on statute, so okay. law enforcement. Okay. So Thank in you. response, it's not a county ordinance. It would be a state crime. Very good. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Von Laren. Um, Commissioner Baxter, go right ahead. You're recognized. The way I understood it is to um, Commissioner Barnett's point, if you throw a rock onto somebody's property, you're not charged with a misdemeanor. But this is saying that if a bullet, let's say it doesn't do any damage, lands on somebody's property, then they are charged with a misdemeanor? Uh, it, I wonder if I could answer that for mm -hmm. you. Just because I've had years of experience in criminal law and procedure. Um, if you hit someone as Commissioner Barnett was talking about, with a rock or some instrumentality that could lead to injury, then that is a crime. That has it's to a hit crime someone. Of battery. It's a crime of battery. Could be aggravated, which is a misdemeanor. Aggravated battery if it could lead to serious injury or death. And does this so, state it has to hit someone? So I believe, uh, uh, and I read this in the paper, and I think she was she came and presented her testimony here before the county commission that there was a young woman who was shot in the stomach. I understand, I'm asking the specific bill we are voting to support or not with a letter. Is it, spec is it specifically state that it has to hit someone or could the bullet just land on their property and it's a misdemeanor? Mr. Bonlaren, I'm gonna refer if, to you. If I, if I can, I can read you the language as it's being amended um, in the bill. And so currently in law, it, it says in regards to discharging firearms in public or residential property that, and this is law today, any person who recreationally discharges a firearm outdoors, including target shooting, in an area that the person knows or reasonably should know is, the primary, is primarily residential in, na in, in nature, that they commit a misdemeanor. And then it goes on to say, in addition to that, or has a residential density, and this is the new language, has a residential density of one and a quarter or more acres per dwelling unit and the firearm discharged by the person does not remain within the boundaries of the property in which the discharge takes place, then that would be also 
con considered a misdemeanor of the first degree under statute 775.082. So it adds that additional language of the one point one and a quarter acre and discharging on property and if that leaves that property, that's the language. So for that's any proposed. reason, if it leaves the property? Well, for any reason, it would have to be um, a firearm discharged by the person within that property and then leave the boundaries of that property. I, again, just to the point of there's so many open-ended, if it ricochets off of something and somebody didn't intend for it to leave their property, are they now, um, you know, charged with a misdemeanor? And, and this is what I'm getting at. And again, to the rock point, you throw a rock onto somebody's property or somebody, you know, on their property, the ground, it's not going to get a misdemeanor. I'm just... Uh, Listen, I will, you know, if this board wants to send a letter, okay. I just don't think this is going to get, um, it's not specific enough. I want to protect our residents. Absolutely. I just think there's so much, too much room for interpretation. It needs to be better defined on how they would like to protect the residents. And that's just where I stand. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Weiss. Thank you. I just to just to add on, I mean, honestly, this is no different than than dumping garbage on somebody else's law, uh, property as well, because it's your garbage. If you can't keep your property or your materials on your own property, then 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 you're you're violating somebody else's property rights. It's that that simple to me, and um, and I under I understand, and I suggest if if. Um, my colleague wishes to have uh, more clarity or more things amended that you work with uh, Senator Berman and Senator Waldron, and I'm sure they would be happy to meet with you and discuss uh, your concerns about this, but I think I'd like to get it on our agenda. Very good, thank you, Commissioner Weiss. Commissioner Woodward, you're rep recognized. Um, <clears throat> I'd also like to point out, it, it is listed in here, because this was one of my questions, that um, this does not count for anyone who is lawfully defending themselves. So if you are doing, you know, self-defense, this does not, this is only for recreation. Mm -hmm. Am I? Mm -hmm. That's okay. correct. That's correct. Okay. If there's no other lights, I, I just have a few words about it. I think that um, working in the legislature with gun issues that the, um, and I'm going to say this and it may not uh, be well accepted, but uh, the NRA should get behind this because it's gun safety. And the first rule of the NRA is gun safety. And anyone who is using a firearm in a recreational way and is not uh, being responsible with the use of that firearm should either not use that firearm or be charged criminally uh, because it can certainly uh, lead to injury and, and harm. So, uh, Commissioner Barnett, you have something to say, sir. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to agree with your recent, most recent comment. Um, I did take the NRA gun safety course. Um, some of you may have also. The first lesson they taught me was that once you fire a bullet, you own that bullet until it reaches its final destination, whether it's on your property or on somebody's grass or on somebody's back. Now, with regards to the uh, question about a berm or a fence, what's a bullet, well, what's a berm gonna do if a gun is fired into the air over a fence? Mm -hmm. That bullet still has to come down as everything else that goes up. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we are ready for a vote. If I could have a uh, first, anybody wants to? Uh, I'll go ahead and make a motion. That's very good. We have a motion by, um, by Commissioner uh, Weiss, and uh, we have a second by Commissioner Barnett. Do Excuse me, Mayor? Yes. Uh, could we clarify the motion for the sake of the clerk? Okay, let's read it from the... Um, Motion would be that uh, uh, we support uh, adding uh, SB. I'm going to read it right here. SB 259 slash Senate Bill 270, which revises prohibition on discharging of firearms in residential area. To our, to our legislative agenda. Very good. Okay. Very good. All those for it. Is there anybody who is opposed? Very good. Okay, see that it passes unanimously. Very good. Um, and uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Bon Laren for that good explanation of that. So um, we are now with uh, 
Let me see, who has, okay, we're gonna skip you, Commissioner Barnett, for a few minutes on your comments. Um, and uh, Commissioner Woodward, you had your comments. Uh, Commissioner Sarah Baxter, go right ahead. I just would like to make the motion to request an offsite proclamation for American Supercar Week, January 6th to the 10th. Second. All right, all those for it, anybody oppose? See that it passes unanimously. And um, Commissioner Bar Mac Barnard. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, several things. Um, I do want to recognize former West Palm Beach City Commissioner Richard Rouse, who's uh, here at the meeting. Um, to, um, you know, want to wish everyone a happy holidays. Uh, yesterday I sent a memo um, that would basically, for us to create a formal process to evaluate on an annual basis the job performance of the following positions the county administrator, the county attorney, and the internal auditor. Um, we received the, the organizational chart for the county, which was like we received one in November, and I believe we received the updated organizational chart this morning, which, you know, at the top it says that, you know, the electorate, our residents of Palm Beach County are uh, you know, the top of this organizational chart. And then we have our elected constitutional officers on one side, the Board of County Commissioners, and then we have the independent officials. Uh, we as a Board of County Commissioners <clears throat> can only hire and fire three individuals, which is the county attorney, the county administrator, and the internal auditor. And I believe that it is important for us to be able to evaluate their performance on an annual basis as a board. Uh, this allows us to provide feedback to the people that we can hire and fire, to provide documentation of what we expect of them, and also to, uh, to you know, to, to look at their performance through a defined time period. And the goal is always to provide clear communications of the job expectations and the goals. And, you know, since we received this organization, organizational chart, we don't get a chance to decide, you know, how the county organization is structured, it is up to the county administrator. Since this is the only thing that we should do, I believe that it's important and necessary for us to have a formal process to evaluate our the people that we hire and fire. Hi, Vice Mayor uh, Marino. Is that a motion? That is a motion. I'll second. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Baxter? She beat me to it. Oh, okay. Uh, and Commissioner Barnett. Thank you. I just had a question. <clears throat> Since this would be a, a system where staff would be evaluating their own job performance. Staff does not. This is this is us as county commissioners to evaluate. <clears throat> well, we would need county attorney. And I don't know who in county administration would work with us to create that process, because we have to create that process, the timing, when. And so, county attorney, if you can help us a little bit. Sure, the HR department can certainly help create an evaluation tool, give you some options to present to you that you could determine what you like. Okay, and uh, well, I need also a time frame on them providing that to us. I would think a month is plenty of okay. time. Okay, and then so, and also I would like to know for us to also decide as a board, when would we like to evaluate the, those, those officials? So in that way, the, those are things that I'd like for us to consider when we're making that decision. Okay, okay. I just um, wanted to make sure I understand that it would be the seven of us 
conducting that evaluation? Yes, okay. it would be just the seven of us conducting evaluation of the people that we hire and that we fire. Uh, I received a memo from, I believe, Mr. Zamor this morning that says that the, the, in, their, the internal auditor committee, they have a review. Great, but I believe that this is a decision that should be decided by us and so in that way, everyone knows exactly what we expect of them. Uh, so if they're not meeting our standards, they would know it and they can make improvements. Or if we don't like it, then they can go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, Commissioner Baxter, okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions for um, Ms. Kaufman, if I could. Did you want to no, say I'm something? Still... So go right ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, as regard Trying to answer the question, I would like to see um, the reviews done, you know, mid-year before we do budgeting, so on. That's just an idea because right now, this time of year, I feel like between the legislative session and wow, um, everything that in holidays, right, that goes on this time of year, I just think it would get very um, lost. So I would like to um, maybe aim for a June time frame. June? Sometime in June. It doesn't have to be first week, second week. I guess this would be a uh, question to you, uh, yep. Commissioner Bernard. I would say on before we go on our commissioner's break. Yeah. Which is, you know, so August, so right before we go on break, so at least we have a time frame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So okay. do you want to include this in, yes. um, okay, that would be June of 2024. Yeah, June or July, I June, think. June or July, but yeah. on before our, our break. Mm -hmm. How about if we say June 30th or okay. you know, last yeah. week in June? Okay. Within that time frame is good with me. Hmm? I, w I well, wouldn't, let's not keep it specific. Let's say on or before the mm -hmm. break. July 1st, or, right, our, on or before our, July 1st. Maybe let's okay. do the break, so in that way that gives us the time frame. The, our break is before August 1st, so that's why. And typically in July we have like 900 meetings. <laughs> so is that, is this on or before? On or before July 1st? No, or? on or before July 31st. I think that would allow us to. On or before July 31st. Yeah. Would that give us enough time to act if we, okay, mm -hmm. if we go on. Uh, um, I, and I see Vice Mayor Moreno's light on. I was, do you mind if I ask Oh no, you question? want to continue, go right ahead. Uh, Sorry. I'm so sorry. I wanted to know, do, and this is for um, Commissioner Bernard, do you want HR to meet with us individually? or set this up in public for this review process? No, this is for them to provide us the different mechanism to do that. And then uh, when, when we meet again, then we can make that decision in terms of how we want to have, I, I, I believe that the review process should be open, it should be in public. That's not what I meant, I meant setting up the review process. Like said, because right now, I guess we're going to have to come up with questions and standards of what we expect to see, right? Yes. So I'm assuming each commissioner would like to give their own input that's, of what they would like to see in me. it. That's that's fine with me. That's fine with me. And it's so the direction would be for HR to meet with each indiv each individual commissioner to determine some of the things that they would like to see, and then to present to us a final product yeah. uh, that we can make a decision on. That, that was my question, thank, thank you. you. Okay, uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you. I don't want this to be too long because you know we start getting into budgets and the election, so um, I would encourage this to be before July 31st, so not. Give us a date and we'll see what, if it's. It, what, what I'm trying to say is, I, I think we as a, as a group can get together with HR relatively quickly after everything happens in the beginning of January, we got FAC and we've got Palm Beach County Day. But I think we have plenty of time to get together with HR um, and then we can better understand the process for us. And I don't think, I mean, I don't think we need to wait to June or July. I, I, so I would like to see it. Maybe, may I suggest that we have a review date before so that the stop date is July 31. We may want to have a review date, and I'm looking at you, Commissioner Bernard, a review date of possibly April. I'm, I'm fine with that. Is that fine I would with like that? It, and then, like, and then I'd so like it tomorrow, before. but. Right. 
So if there's enough time, would you like something like that? Yes, Commissioner please. Marina? So why don't we do like a review date of April 1st. April 1st, that's a good date. April 1st, knowing that we have a stop date has to be done uh, by July 31st and, and possibly sooner if, if we can get it all done. Um, and um, I'm gonna just go over, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, we have over here. Yes, I don't know which one of you had your light on first. Uh, it's a gentleman. Now, that looks like Commissioner Woodward. Is that okay? Uh, yes, please. Okay, fine. Uh, just so I understand, we're, we're talking about two different things. First is setting the parameters Process for the evaluation, the and then the second date is the actual evaluation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so which is which? Wait. I think uh, within the, by the, end of January, I think that's what the county attorney is saying, that we would probably, we would get the process and then and for then us to have the evaluation to be done by April, is it April 1st? April 1st. 1st April 1st. So what's the yeah. July date for? That's, Stop. we would be doing that on an annual basis. So let's say we would do it on or before uh, July, thir July 31st in the, going forward. Going forward. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Barnett. Uh, real quick, thank you, Mayor. I, if I understand correctly, uh, Commissioner Bernard, you mentioned uh, HR, uh, based on what you're recommending, would be meeting with us individually. I believe the Vice Mayor mentioned uh, meeting as a group with HR. Um, no, 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 no. I thought I heard you say that. Uh, that's why I was asking if you were suggesting a workshop or something. No, okay. no. individually, <laughs> HR would meet with each individual commissioner, and then they would present something to us before the end of January. All right, I understand better now, thank you. Okay, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions uh, for our attorney. Uh, first of all, has this ever been done before the Board of County Commissioners of Palm Beach County? I am not aware of it, um, but, but my time here is limited, <laughs> so I'm not sure, you know, Mr. Adi may be able to tell us if he has any familiarity with reviews. I can add, uh, sure, go ahead, the school you... district provides reviews of the superintendent, the uh, general counsel, mm -hmm. and the, I believe, the IG. So if, since we've never done it, I think this is the best time for us to create that process. And Mr. Audi or whoever can find different departments or throughout the state that can create, sure. Uh, sure. that could, show them the different ways that it could be done. This is, this is the reason, and I'll get to you in a minute, Vice Mayor. The reason I asked if it had ever been done before is that do we have a model or formula that we would direct HR I think that to? there are formulas out there. Good, okay, yeah. I appreciate that. Something that is at the level of I what think we so. are about to do. Yes. Very good, Vice Mayor. And just to add to that, we, the cities mm -hmm. evaluate their city managers um, TPA, we evaluate the executive director. Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council, we evaluate the executive director. Those are the only people that we hire and fire, so those are the only people we are allowed to evaluate. Okay. But I think it's a, it's a good procedure and process to have in place. Thank you. And the reason I ask, again, is if there's a formula, um, and I think that the formula should, should uh, replicate what these other cities and uh, school boards uh, districts do as well. Very good. And after we uh, meet, then um, we will have a discussion of this on the full board in public transparent mm -hmm. uh, at that time. And is that okay, uh, Commissioner? I'm going to read uh, some of the additions to what you are asking, Commissioner Bernard, and uh, you listen along with me so that the clerk will know exactly what we want to do with this. Um, we'd like to direct staff to develop and present to the Board of County Commissioners a formal process to evaluate on an annual basis the job performance of the following positions, the county administrator, county attorney, and the internal auditor. This will, uh, we will have a review of this on April 1st to the members of the board uh, with a definite uh, conclusion by July 31st with uh, members of uh, HR meeting individually with each commissioner uh, to formally evaluate uh, the, these three positions. Is there anything else you would like to add, Madam 
I looked first to the, to the attorney. I'm a little confused. <laughs> my, my last understanding was that I am going to, or, or HR is going to work with, and find a formula by the end of July, um, June, sorry. January. January. January, I'll get the date eventually, January and that um, we will have the first review come April 1st, and that will be a board review done in the public. Thereafter, it would be on an annual basis before the board um, goes on its break before uh, July 31st of each year. That's a decision that we can decide at that time when we, when we after get After you do your first? After we do the first review. Okay. We don't, I don't want to get stuck on that issue. I think we can kind of decide that at that time. Okay. Fine. Sounds good. Commissioner Baxter. The only thing I was going to add is you said on April 1st, which is a Monday. I'm just wondering, do we want to make that a no later than date versus an on date? On or about. On or about. Okay. On or, on about. or about April 1st. Okay. okay. Um, is there, are there any other questions with regard to the wording before we take a vote? Okay. And I think we already have a first and a second. Um, and is that okay to go with these modifications for the first and the second on this, on this? Maybe we'll do it again. Based on what was read into the record by, by uh, uh, Ms. Kaufman and approved by Commissioner Bernard, do we have a first on this? So yes, we do. We have a mayor. first by second. Commissioner Bernard, a second, again, by the Vice Mayor. All those four, anybody opposed? see that it passes unanimously. Very nice, thank you, that was good, that was good. Okay, um, and we're back to Commissioner comments. Uh, Commissioner Barnett, are you ready, sir? Thank you, go right ahead. Thank you for indulging me, my apologies. That's all right. <laughs> well, I just wanna wish everyone a very happy holidays, a happy new year um, with everybody that you're gonna be spending the holidays with, with your families and friends. I'll be going up to see family up in New York end of this week. Oh, good. Uh, not, not the happiest of occasions, but um, it's nice to see my New York family. I'm um, going to be enjoying that snow. And uh, uh, it looks like rain at the Pinstripe Bowl. Going to see our <laughs> hurricanes take on Rutgers. That's, uh, you know, haven't had a chance to support them all year, so figure while I'm up there. I also want to thank all of uh, our county administrators, uh, staff, all county staff, however many, 6,000 employees who work every day to make Palm Beach County such a wonderful place to live. I had a chance to spend time with about 500 employees from Parks and Rec. Thank you very much to Ms. Jennifer Cirillo for the invitation and for the barbecue, best, some of the best I've ever had. And it was um, homemade. <laughs> um, I also um, want to, at the, as we're reaching the end of the year, um, request permission from the Board of County Commissioners to direct staff to place a recycling bin down on the first floor of this building. It was a request that's been made to us several times by our friends at the Sierra Club. And I thought maybe um, we could take care of that business today if there's no objection. I also want to um, make this motion in honor of my commission assistant who's gonna be leaving at the end of this year, Catherine Capps, who has also been pushing me to ask for uh, permission to request uh, a recycling bin in the first floor of our building. I, if I have to make a motion, I'll make a motion. No, it's okay, I, I don't think there's any objection to the recycling no, bin. No objection, thank you very much. You know, it's the right thing to do. I gotta take care of our planet. It's the best gift we can give to Mother Earth. <laughs> Happy holidays to all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner Barnett uh, and Vice Mayor Marino. Thank you. A couple comments. Um, to the attorney, I'm not sure about if there is a process in place with the House about when we can do reviews and changes due to budgets. Can you check into that? I think it is... House Bill 735, Senate Bill 734. Um, there might be a time frame preceding a general election where this, okay, because you, so we'll not do anything that's illegal um, for the contract re reviews. Um, secondly, Mayor, I don't think we adopted or we made, filed um, 
motion to receive and file the board appointment. So I'd be happy to make that motion to receive and file the board and commission assignments by district commissioner. So moved. Second. Okay. Right here. Very good. Okay. All those for it. Anybody opposed? See that it passes unanimously. Um, I would also like, under the mayor's name, a letter of support for the BDB for reaccreditation, and I have a sample letter. If you would like to sign your name to that, the BDB is looking I for reaccreditation. Seen this until just this minute. What so, do you think, Commissioner Baxter? <laughs> At least I have 30 days to review this. You should definitely take it and read it. I don't know. I, I think uh, so. The BDB I'm has sure. asked us for a letter of reaccreditation, so I'm giving it to you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. I'll review it. And I'll let you know. Thank you. Um, also, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Everybody be safe no matter where your travels take you. Mine will be taking me to New York also, oh, New York. upstate New York. Hopefully we will see snow, but you never know. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you very much. And thank you, staff. Um, we had a very lively agenda review yesterday, and um, I do thank you all for your patience with me. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Madam Mayor. Yes. You. Mine was lively also. <laughs> I'm glad I'm the first at the agenda review. I just get everybody warmed up so they can go on to yours. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Baxter, go right ahead. Thank you, Mayor. I forgot uh, to, I want to wish every, all the staff, employee, everyone in the county, um, please have a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, enjoy the time uh, with your families. And have a good one, guys. Thanks so much, Commissioner Baxter. Um, you're free to put your lights on any time. I just, uh, is, uh, Melanie Tushin is here, and, and I just want you to stand up. This, Melanie has been my uh, intern for many months, and she's done a wonderful job. And what happens is as soon as somebody gets really good, uh, somebody takes them away. So she's now going to be uh, working for Representative Linda Waldron. We wish you well, Melanie. And uh, I know that you're going into a good office uh, with uh, Representative Waldron. So thank you. Thank you so much for your service for us and all the work that you've done. Is um, Bernhardt's not here anymore? Where'd he go? Um, OK. And I want to, um, oh, Commissioner Barnett. I do apologize. Uh, That's okay. As we're leaving, one of our one of our staff members are leaving. We have someone new starting temporarily. I wanted to recognize uh, Keely, our new intern, who will be working with us for the next three months. Oh, very Just nice. Just want to make an introduction. Welcome. Thank you for coming to join us. Thank you, and welcome to the family. Um, I just like to say, um, oh, here he is. Thank you, uh, Commander Barnard. There was um, this is a mayor's personal privilege. I heard that there was a family that was stranded on a very dangerous area of uh, a highway going into Tampa and had a flat tire, it was a family, and could not get AAA out, could not get um, anybody from the city of Tampa or in that county, And uh, but with one phone call to uh, our commander Bernhardt, the Florida Highway Patrol showed up with a trooper husband. He, uh, came out, took care of it, and led that family to safety. So I want to thank you. Uh, for wherever you are, you're still a part of the Palm Beach County family. We appreciate so much what you do for, to continue to do for us uh, uh, forever. And I appreciate it very much. That family, wherever they are, appreciates it as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I'd like to... Um, Wish, I hope everybody had a wonderful Hanukkah. I was I had the opportunity to be at the Delray City Hall, Delray City Place for lighting of the menorah. And as someone uh, so beautifully said to me the other day, this is, was a difficult Hanukkah. And I just want everyone to know that um, that is a festival of lights and may the light shine upon everybody with the idea that we need to make sure that we take care of our oldest friend, and that's the state of Israel. Thank you, Mr. Von Laren, for giving us that, that or giving me uh, that insight. And of course, I love Christmas. Uh, there's nothing better than to think about that little baby out there with no place to go, a little homeless rascal. So we, we wish uh, everybody from my office to everybody else a Merry Christmas, 
and I hope that there's not a family here in our county that would go without a toy or a special, uh, special something to eat on this Christmas. And a happy new year. I look forward to a wonderful year. Thank you to all the staff. I'm looking at Aaron, Patrick, and all of you, Todd, all of you. Thank you so much for helping us in the county this last year. And with that, we're going to close and adjourn this meeting uh, on this uh, beautiful Palm Beach County Day. It is adjourned. Thank you. Let's get it.